Buonasera a tutti, buonasera, benvenuti a una montagna di libri. Saluto tutti gli amici che Good ci evening, sono. welcome to una montagna di libri. I'd like to say hello to all of you on Facebook, Instagram. Uh, this is the fe literary festival at Cortina d'Ampezzo and thank you very much to the Corriere della Sera online right now. Looking forward to meeting in person in July and August uh, for the rest of the season. Uh, I'd like to point out uh, that uh, you will have all information about our festival on our website, uh, unamontagnadelibri.it. Before beginning this uh, conversation, uh, we're very much looking forward to it. We're very happy uh, to be having it. I'd like to thank our institutional sponsors, uh, the Regional Government of Veneto, the Municipality of Cortina d'Ampezzo, uh, Audi, the main sponsor, and Corriere della Sera as our main media uh, partner, and Converso Audio from Milan. In uh, 2012, one of the greatest American writers asked uh, an American biographer uh, to uh, write uh, the story of his own life. Nine years later, that story becomes a book. Uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome Mr. Blake Bailey. Thank you very much for being here at Montagna de Libri. Welcome, Blake. It's a pleasure, Francesco. Grazie. Uh, Philip Roth, a biography. Uh, a biography. Philip Roth, a biography, is a monumental reconstruction of the life uh, of Philip Milton Roth, born in 1933 and dead in 2018, unfortunately. Um, he wrote uh, Port Noyes Lament, American Pastoral, and many other books, 31 books written by him. In 898 pages, Mr. Bailey, after nine years of work, followed Mr. Roth from uh, his early days in New Jersey uh, to the years of college success and uh, throughout the 31st, uh, 31 books that he has written. His biography was also the center of a literary case in America. Uh, first it was published and then withdrawn from the market um, because of uh, allegations to the author and then published again by another publishing house on June 15th, the book was uh, indeed uh, uh, available on audio on the internet. Uh, Skyhorse uh, will release it on June 29th. Uh, in Italy, will be available through a Naudi. After a written interview to Mr. Antonio Monda, this is the first time that Mr. Blake Bailey accepts to talk to the Italian audience, and thank you very much once more. Mr. Bailey, first question. Um, how long did it take Mr. Philip Roth to decide that someone had to write his biography, and how important was it for him that someone would indeed write a story of his life? Um, it was very important, uh, though it was a prospect that worried Philip um, <laughs> because he'd had, you know, um, an, an interesting and in many ways very complicated life. Um, he first became interested in getting a biography written after Claire Bloom's uh, memoir, Leaving a Doll's House, was published in 1996, um, which portrayed Philip in a very negative uh, light. Um, and he wanted to get his own side of the story out there. Um, so he asked his best friend, um, Ross Miller, um, to work on a biography. Um, but <laughs> that involved massive conflicts of interest and ended badly um, after stops and starts in 2009. After that, Philip approached his uh, friend Hermione Lee uh, the great literary biographer, and she tentatively agreed uh, to work on a biography, but she had to finish her uh, biography of Penelope Fitzgerald first. Um, and Philip didn't want to wait because in the meantime, he had gotten a diagnosis of congestive heart failure. I mean, he'd had coronary artery disease ever since 1982, so it was upgraded to congestive heart failure in 2011, and he figured if he didn't get started on a biography soon, he would die. Um, that is when he met me in May of 2012, and we had a chat, and he agreed to let me do it. Ecco, 
ringrazio. Well, thank you uh, to Paolo Mariano Zeda who is translating our conversation. Blake, second question. What does it mean uh, to be granted uh, the permission by Philip Roth to write his biography? Uh, any access to uh, confidential documentation? Um, yes, I had exclusive access to confidential um, information. Um, and it's caused quite a controversy uh, because the world, all the scholars who devote their work to Philip Roth and uh, so on, want access to these same papers. Um, and they don't know what Philip's estate is going to do with them. They don't know whether they're going to destroy the papers um, or whether they're going to um, deposit them at the Library of Congress and place them under a... Uh, public seal, an embargo for 30 years, or what? Anyway, I'm the only one who had access to these papers. Um, and some of them were <laughs> were of a very private nature. Uh, there was a long rebuttal to Claire Bloom's Leaving a Doll's House that Philip titled Notes for My Biographer. And uh, there was an even longer, uh, like 700 and something pages, um, rebuttal to his best friend and former biographer, Ross Miller, called Notes on a Slander Monger. Um, all these papers were on the third floor of my house until last week when I put them into 20 bankers' boxes and returned them to the estate. Ecco. Well, of course, the book uh, you uh, made a reference uh, is uh, Living a Doll's House by Claire Bloom, uh, second wife, a uh, second wife we we're going to talk about uh, uh, more extensively afterwards. When uh, did you meet Philip Roth the first time? Tell us more about that. Um, I met Philip on roughly May 27th, 2012. Um, I remember that date because it was John Cheever's uh, centennial um, and I am John Cheever's biographer. So I was giving a reading that night um, with some other writers at the 92nd Street Y. And I stopped by Philip's apartment on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Um, and he was recovering from back surgery. So he was in a lot of pain but he was trying very hard to be, uh, you know, a, a jolly host. Um, and we had a nice meeting, but he didn't uh, say anything about the biography during that first meeting. Um, and I said, well, where are we leaving this? And he said, we'll come back in a couple of days. So two days later, I came back to his apartment and his mood had changed <laughs> and he was very grim. Um, and I asked about his back. I said, how's your back feeling? And he said, you didn't come here to talk about my back. Sit down. And um, he had this sheaf of paper with questions, many, many questions written on them. And uh, the first question was, why should a Gentile from Oklahoma write my biography? And I said, I'm not a bisexual alcoholic with an ancient Puritan lineage, but I wrote the biography of John Cheever. And I think that's kind of what Philip wanted to hear, because all his life he's been saying, I'm not a Jewish American writer. <laughs> I'm an American writer who's also a Jew. So I don't think he wanted to be, he didn't want to be judged through a Jewish lens, uh, be it a Jewish moral lens, or sort of a Jewish cultural lens. He wanted that degree of objectivity. So I think that was in, uh, a point in my favor. When it comes to the Jewishness of Philip Roth, we're going to be talking about it later on, but there is something that I want to investigate upon. You said, Blake, that Roth had, uh, to a certain extent, uh, a certain control vis-à-vis -vis what um, is the content of the biography, all the questions you were talking about, or was it just uh, a number of questions he asked at the very beginning, and then it led 
let you free to write uh, without any interventions? I had complete independence. Uh, the way Philip, <laughs> he would have hated this word. Um, he would have called it psychobabble. Um, <laughs> but um, Philip was very controlling. Uh, anybody who knew Philip well would tell you that. Um, and the way he tried to control me as his biographer was by flooding me with his opinions, okay, which he hoped I would then adopt as my own, okay? So he would send me a given file, say. Uh, maybe they were legal papers relating to his first divorce from Maggie. And he would attach a two or three or seven or eight or nine page memo to that file telling me exactly what to think about it, okay? Um, and depending on which critic you read, um, I was extremely independent in my opinions. David Remnick of The New Yorker said I was industrious, rigorous, and uncowed. In other words, unintimidated by Philip. And that's true. I was, whatever else I was, I was not intimidated by Philip. And I went my own way. And I think I wrote a very objective, rigorously critical, both of the work and of the man, uh, biography. Ecco, un'ultima domanda sul modo in cui... A last question on the way this biography was written. Uh, the interviews uh, you had with Mr. Philip Roth uh, happened daily, weekly. How did you used to meet with him? Um, when he first hired me, if that's the word, um, I spent a week in Connecticut where he has a house. And we would spend six hours a day in his little studio cottage in the woods. And uh, that's when we did the majority of our interviews. Um, after that, we would do them whenever I happened to be in New York or whenever I happened to be in Connecticut over the years. So my first bulk, uh, my, my first group of interviews was that in the summer of 2012, And my last interview was about, uh, I think, six or seven months before he died in 2017. And we kept in touch. We would talk on the phone and stuff like that. Grazie, Blake Bailey. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Bailey. Uh, Philip Roth wrote uh, 30 one box from the 50s to uh, 2010. Uh, what is the opinion Philip Roth had about his early works and in general of all his books? Um, <laughs> he had a very low opinion of his first book, uh, Goodbye Columbus, which is one of his most beloved books. Um, it won the National Book Award when Philip was 26. He is, to this day, the youngest ever winner of the National Book Award. I think Goodbye Columbus is a charming novella. I think that the stories in that book are brilliant and witty and very accomplished. Um, but Philip doesn't think so. He thinks that it's ju juvenile work. Um, his next novel was massive and sort of in the manner of Henry James. It was letting go. And I find it tedious, but it has brilliant uh, set pieces in it. Uh, when She Was Good was influenced by uh, Flaubert. Um, and again, I think it's too long by half. And I think Philip would grudgingly agree with that. I think he found his voice again with Portnoy. I, Portnoy was a real breakthrough because Philip in person, in real life, he was a joker. You know, he was a spieler, a spritzer. And that's the voice, that's the jazzy voice that he got back in Portnoy. It was Philip's voice, his authentic voice. Um, as far as all of his work is concerned, um, his favorite book was Sabbath Theater, um, kind of for the same reason that Portnoy was a breakthrough. He always said that of all his characters, all his heroes, the one that was most like himself was Mickey Sabbath, which is a terrible admission when you think about it. Um, 
I, I don't agree that Sabbath Theater is his best book, but that's what Philip liked most. And uh, then there was his wonderful um, American trilogy, uh, American Pastoral, uh, the, I Married a Communist, and The Human Stain. And uh, those, the first and, and the last of those are masterpieces. And then the wonderful last novellas, I think, are beautiful reflections on human mortality. Uh, Blake Bailey. Uh, Mr. I... Bailey, uh, you remember uh, that uh, Mr. Sol uh, the, um, Roth had uh, three writers, Norma Corwin, Thomas Wolfe, and the third one uh, uh, he was inspired is Saul Bellow. Uh, I'm talking about Saul Bellow because Saul Bellow came here uh, to Cortina in the 80s, many years after having published uh, um, masterpieces such as Herzog and O.G. March, uh, uh, which influenced Roth a lot. What is he, was he looking w uh, for in Corwin, Wolf and Bellow? Um, Norman Corwin was a now pretty forgotten um, writer during the golden age of radio. And after, at the end of uh, World War II, um, just after Victory in Europe Day, um, on the radio, they aired Norman Corwin's sort of lyrical kind of poem um, on a note of triumph, okay, about the defeat of the Nazis. Um, and Philip was, you know, he was a 12-year-old boy, and he found it very inspiring, very stirring, and he wanted to write patriotic, lyrical radio plays like that. Um, but he grew out of that. I mean, he always loved Norman Corwin's On a Note of Triumph, but he, he kind of put that behind him as uh, a childhood enthusiasm. Thomas Wolfe, you know, in those days, writers of Philip's generation, practically all of them went through a Thomas Wolfe phase when they were young men. Uh, Thomas Wolfe wrote, you know, um, Look Homeward Angel and uh, You Can't Go Home Again. And, you know, he just had that sort of sprawling um, poetic prose style. Um, that, again, was a youthful enthusiasm of Phillips that he grew out of. Saul Bellow was the great literary hero of Phillips' life. Um, Saul Bellow showed him, you know, that you didn't have to, you know, uh, refer to Fowler's modern English, you know, reference guide while you wrote that you could talk in your own voice. Um, you know, that you could wisecrack, that you didn't have to worry so much about the architecture of your plots and, uh, and so on. You know, you, you could write about stuff you knew and you could be funny and interesting about it. Um, so Philip adored Saul Bellow. Saul Bellow by far was, in Philip's eyes, the great genius. Bellow and Faulkner of American literature. Ever since he wrote his uh, first uh, uh, works uh, like uh, uh, Defender of the Faith at the end of the 50s or in Goodbye Columbus, he was accused uh, to be a self-hating Jew. Um, you said it also at the beginning of our conversation. Uh, can you explain to an audience uh, who may not be familiar with the story of Jewishness in America, how is it possible that someone like Philip Roth, who keeps on talking about American Jewish in his books uh, with details, affection, etc., how, how come uh, was he accused uh, of anti-Semitism, as it happens with Rabbi David Seligson in 1962 and many others? Um, well, it was a different time. Um, 1959, when Goodbye Columbus was published, um, that was the year after Leon Uris's Exodus was published um, about the founding of the State of Israel. 
Um, it was the same year that uh, The Diary of Anne Frank uh, debuted on Broadway. Um, Elie Wiesel's uh, Night um, was coming out in its English edition. And the consciousness, the horror, um, and the shame of the Holocaust uh, was very, it was foremost in the minds of American Jews. Um, so they were very sensitive to how they were portrayed um, in the culture. Um, and they didn't want to be rejected by the Gentile majority in America. There was a lot of anti-Semitism still in America, and they were just since the war beginning to, you know, assimilate more successfully. So it was, you know, it was, it was very um, anxiety provoking for someone of Philip's prominence to write about a nice suburban Jewish girl who's having premarital sex with a diaphragm, to write about Epstein, who's a Jewish adulterer, um, to write in Defender of the Faith about Private Grossbart, who uses his Jewishness to sordidly manipulate decent people, and so on. Um, what critics of Philip, who called him a self-hating Jew, chose to ignore was that for every bad Jewish character, there was an equally decent Jewish character. Um, and Philip himself would have agreed with Mark Twain, um, who said, Jews are members of the human race. Worse than that, I cannot say of them. <laughs> One of the uh, unforgettable scenes of uh, his works is when in American Pastoral, uh, with uh, the main characters is being kissed by his uh, daughter um, in a weird form of uh, uh, passion. Uh, Maggie Markinson's daughter, uh, Helen, uh, who was um, part of the family of Philip, once asked him to kiss her the way you kiss my mum. Uh, what about the, what was the end of this story in real life? Uh, Philip did not oblige her. Um, <laughs> You know, I mean, that made an impression on Philip. Um, Helen, uh, his stepdaughter, Maggie's daughter, was 11 at the time. They were returning from the beach. Um, she was in her bathing suit. He had been holding her against the waves uh, all day. And she was a very, um, by her own confession at that age, she was very precocious. Um, and very aware of her own sexuality. And she found the young Philip very attractive. And there was a kind of tension between them. Um, and she, she does not remember the episode. Um, what she said was, I don't remember that particular moment, but I was certainly flirtatious with Philip when I was young. And Philip just said, you know, Yes, there was that tension between me and Helen, but I did not, um, I did not kiss her uh, the way I kissed her mom. Um, but he said that moment always stuck with me. And when he tried to think of what poor Swede Lavove, how, how Swede would try to explain Mary's later terrorism to himself, you know, trying to find out where he had gone wrong. And it would have been natural for a decent man like Swede Lavove to blame himself. Um, he looked back at that moment. And because in, in the book, she says she has a stammer and she says, kiss me the way you kiss mother. And he went and he's so shocked by the request that he goes, no, 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 no. And then he's so appalled that he's made fun of her that he goes ahead and kisses her. And he never forgets that. One lapse, and he blames himself for it for the rest of his life. It's a, it's a brilliant touch, I think. 
Certo, c'è stato evidentemente un... Yes, evidently there has been an add-on in terms of creativity, imagination by Roth as a writer when he turned this episode into literature. Uh, I have asked you this question, Mr. Bailey, because uh, the relationship uh, that Philip had with women is a central theme of, bio of his biography and what has been written about this biography. Uh, a rather uh, um, severe criticism was that the problem that Roth had with women was fundamentally a problem with reality. Roth uh, usually said about his women that they represented something which is rather different than just being someone for, some, for the person you love. Uh, what about the uh, allegations of misogyny? Do you share? Um. I think that Philip could be, I mean, he has very monstrous women characters in his work. Uh, Maureen Tarnopol in My Life is a Man, um, the, 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 the wife of Kepish in The Professor of Desire, um, Lucy in When She Was Good, and so on. Um, these are very unsympathetic characters. Um, but Philip felt that he was writing about a particular woman, um, Maggie, in the case of Marine Tarnopol, his first wife. And he had tried to sort of create a sympathetic version of Maggie in his first full-length novel, Letting Go, as Martha Regenhart. And he had tried to write a couple of plays about Maggie also trying to sort of humanize her as he saw it. And finally, with My Life as a Man, which was published in 1974, he said the reason these early versions of Maggie don't work is because I'm sentimentalizing her. I'm romanticizing her. She was a criminal. So I'm going to show her as the criminal that she was. Um, that said, he was he was writing about a woman, not women. And there are, again, very sympathetic women in Philip's um, fiction. Uh, Brenda Potemkin is spunky and smart and very attractive. Uh, Maria Freshfield in The Counter Life is very intelligent and witty and decent. And, 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 and Dranka, Dranka is as sexually filthy as Mickey Sabbath, but she's very lovable. So, you know, I mean, Philip did write some pretty vile women characters, but he did the same to the men, and he also had uh, lovable, decent women characters. In his real life, you know, Philip's behavior, he could objectify women. He was not monogamous. He did not have a monogamous bone in his body. Uh, he could not be faithful. Um, you know, and Claire Bloom in her memoir, Leaving a Doll's House, um, quite properly showed the extent to which Philip uh, was unfaithful to her. Um, and also he could be very dismissive and mocking when anyone tried to criticize him for these tendencies. Uh, he was like Mickey Sabbath in that respect. You know, Mickey Sabbath is caught stealing the panties of a young woman by the young woman's father, and he's totally unapologetic and, and joking about it. Well, that was kind of Philip's tendency, too, and, and obviously that rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. All that said, Philip had lifelong friendships with formidable intellectual women, uh, Judith Thurman, Hermione Lee, Claudia Roth Pierpont, etc., um, so in his everyday life, um, women liked Philip and, and vice versa. Beh, tra queste amiche... Uh, Among I... these friends uh, who have uh, protected him uh, to the last minute, uh, there is an American woman who, Mia, my, Mia Farrow, uh, was not really 
suite uh, with many others. Uh, we know that, for instance, with Woody Allen, Mia Farrow was very harsh. Uh, what about the friendship between the two? Between Philip and Mia Farrow? Um, you know, I mean, uh, they, uh, what, what can I say? They liked each other a lot. Um, Mia is very lovable and, and, and very smart, and she was fond of Philip. She has a good sense of humor. She appreciated Philip's better qualities. And Philip, when he, when he was fond of you, especially if you were a woman, and this could rub women the wrong way, he became very paternalistic. You know, he would say, he would kind of boss you but he thought he was bossing you for your own good, right? Um, so, for example, when Maureen Orth um, revisited the whole Woody Allen scandal in 2013 in this long piece in Vanity Fair, suddenly Mia Farrow, you know, was under siege again from the press, her phone was ringing off the hook, and so on. And Philip wrote her this very bossy, all capital letters letter saying, you know, don't talk to these people, say, I've got to play with my grandchildren and hang up, you know, like that. And she said it was just like being married to Frank Sinatra, <laughs> you know, that Sinatra would always boss her around and say, you know, put your sweater on, button it up, that kind of thing. Um, and so she said, you know, Philip, he kind of had different modes toward women with, with his intellectual friends like Hermione Lee and Judith Thurman. He was on an equal footing. Right. Um, but with someone like Mia, um, he loved her, but he felt like it was his place to sort of boss her around and talk down to her. She said that, but she loved him anyway. He was very lovable. Roth, uh, Vice versa, Roth uh, uh, did not like Woody Allen. There are pages uh, in uh, your biography where you quote Roth saying that Woody is a crocodile uh, um, uh, and it's a dumb, uh, schlemy crocodile and uh, he said that he was fake from head to toe. Is that so? Uh, according to Philip, it was. Um, Philip started by thinking that, uh, that Woody Allen was a phony and a bad artist. Um, Claire Bloom, um, uh, uh, roughly a year before she finally married Philip in 1990, um, she played Martin Landau's wife in Crimes and Misdemeanors. Um, and she had a very bad impression of Woody Allen, that he was sort of this sinister, um, there was something missing in the man, is what she said. Um, and Philip agreed, and Philip thought these movies were kitsch. Um, he, was, he was infuriated by crimes and misdemeanors because there is a subplot where the Woody Allen character is doing a documentary about this humanitarian philosopher kind of based on Primo Levi. Um, you know, a person, uh, who, a Jew who survived the Holocaust and still has this sort of hopeful humanistic philosophy. And then in the movie, like Primo Levi, he ends up killing himself. And Philip was enraged by that. He thought it was a desecration of Primo Levi's memory. Um, and he thought the movie itself was disgusting kitsch, uh, sentimental, false, and just idiotic. He hated it. Um, so he thought that, and, and plus Woody Allen with his highfalutin references to August Strindberg and Kafka and so on, Freud, um, he said, and Mia Farrow said that Woody Allen never finished a book in his life. Okay, so that that was all pseudo intellectual uh, stuff. That was Philip's perception of Woody Allen. Um, when he found out about, uh, or when Mia Farrow told him the allegations of molesting uh, Dylan and so forth, um, he was re understandably repelled by that. On top of already thinking Woody Allen was a bad artist.
Certo. Eh, parliamo... Well, let's talk about another wonderful uh, book, uh, uh, The Plot Against America, uh, which is a dystopia in which uh, Roth imagines that uh, uh, Charles Lindbergh, uh, uh, the, fi uh, the philonazist uh, uh, pilot, uh, becomes president of the U.S. Maya Mia Farrow said uh, that uh, Roth, before dying, uh, after the advent of Trump uh, said uh, that uh, uh, Trump was uh, even worse than uh, the than Lindbergh as president. Was that so? Um, yes. I mean, uh, Philip thought that Donald Trump was barely human. Um, Charles Lindbergh was an aviation hero, um, and whether or not you agreed with his far right America isolationist um, ideology. Um, Philip thought that he was at least sincere in his political beliefs, um, whereas Donald Trump um, is an unscrupulous opportunist. Um, he's a liar. Um, he's a bully. Um, and he's, as Philip put it, a malignant narcissist. Um, and he was a disaster um, in Philip's eyes and for what it's worth in mine, uh, for this country and for the world. And um, Philip despised him. And Philip died um, in, he was very pessimistic about the way things were going in this country when he died. Um. Blake Bailey, Philip Roth. Mr. Bailey, Philip Roth uh, received uh, hundreds of different prizes, but he never was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature. When it comes to getting prizes, Saul Bellow used to say, the kid in me is really delighted, but the adult in me is rather skeptical. Um, what about Roth, about all this story about the prizes? <laughs> Um, Philip, of course, appropriated Saul Bellow's comment about the Nobel Prizes and prizes in general uh, for his own boilerplate. He also liked to say that the child in me is delighted, but the adult is skeptical. And he was, it was true and it wasn't true. Um, Philip took me to his trophy room in Connecticut. Um, it's this uh, paneled dark kind of big closet off the landing on the second floor of his house. It's a very dingy room. <laughs> and everything from his, you know, Pulitzer Prize to his National Book Awards, plural, um, to his three Penn Faulkners, all these awards, I mean, he won oodles <laughs> of awards during his life, are up there with like his Wequaic High School um, diploma. <laughs> and so on, very haphazardly um, nailed to the wall. So, you know, I, I think that's true. I think Philip was delighted for five minutes and then he kind of got over it. Um, that said, the Nobel would have been a, a lovely feather in his cap, and I think he wanted it very badly, but I don't think, you know, his life was ruined by never getting the Nobel. And beyond a point, he really didn't expect to get it. I mean, he thought that Claire Bloom's leaving a doll's house pretty much put an end to his serious hopes of getting the Nobel. But then he wrote, you know, the American trilogy, and that was such a towering achievement that he started to hope again. And then he stopped hoping um, around 2007 or 2008. And he never really expected to get it after that. I should add, some awards were a lot more meaningful to Philip than others. And perhaps, I think there were two awards that gave him a lot of satisfaction. One was the honorary degree from the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York, because that was kind of a rapprochement between him and the Jewish cultural establishment who had been at, at war with each other. Um, so he was very pleased about that. And he also was very pleased to be a commander of uh, the Legion of Honor. Um, and that was a wonderful ceremony at the French uh, Embassy on Fifth Avenue in Manhattan. Ecco, che, mh, quando aveva parlato 
When you spoke with Roth at the very beginning of your conversations, Roth told you, I don't want you, uh, Blake, uh, to rehabilitate me, make me interesting. What is the most interesting thing, the most fascinating thing about Philip Roth after all the study you carried out? Um, Philip has kind of a public reputation as a provocateur and, you know, a bad boy. Um, and certainly his work, well, I mean, there's the humanistic work, uh, such as those last novels like Every Man and uh, Indignation are very somber novels about human mortality. And of course, the American trilogy are essentially tragic. But what Philip as a human being is mostly identified with are books like Portnoy and Sabbath Theater, where, you know, he's a sexual rogue and uh, a jokester. Um, what I was, I think, most surprised by was how essentially decent and honorable um, and kind Philip was in everyday life. Um, you know, he could be abrasive and he had a sharp tongue, um, but he was essentially very generous and well-meaning. And I think any of his close friends would say the same thing. Well, uh, we're about to finish, uh, but uh, uh, the release of your book has been accompanied uh, by allegations uh, uh, by women you were familiar with. Uh, what happened? Uh, um, did you ever go to court or is it just on the press? And what would you answer? Um, no, no charges have been made against me, and I have denied the allegations. Um, some of the allegations are more outrageously false um, than others. Um, that's not to say that I have not, you know, done things that have caused pain in my private life um, to my wife and daughter, um, which I regret very deeply. Um, but I did nothing illegal, and uh, some of these the worst of the charges are quite false. What about your reaction when you knew that your publisher decided to withdraw from the market this book, which is just being republished by Sky Horse? Uh, how did it happen? Uh, how did you come to know that? Uh, the way the rest of the world came to know it through the New York Times. Um, and I was appalled. Um, this is almost unprecedented. Um, you know, there have been books such as Woody Allen's memoir um, that the publisher decided not to publish um, because of allegations against Woody Allen. But the book hadn't been published yet. My book had been published. Um, it's um, was called a narrative masterwork by Cynthia Ozick on the front page of the New York Times book review. It's a, a work about a, a person of monumental cultural importance, um, and it was a book that was widely acclaimed. So, you know, I mean, I think that book burning is uh, a tactic of Nazi Germany, and I don't think that you should you know, I, I don't think you can tell people that you can't read books, you can't listen to music, you can't watch movies, you can't look at paintings because the creators of those works were morally imperfect, um, according to whose dubious um, authority. Um, so I, you know, I thought it was appalling. I mean, what are we? I was I was disgusted. And again, I'm sorry, Francesco, again, these allegations are, are unsubstantiated. I have been charged with no crime. You know, they're holding me to the standard of Caesar's wife, that I have to be above suspicion. And that's crazy. And every author in the world should be alarmed by that, that, you know, anyone who, who bears them a grudge can make an accusation and the person can be declared a non-person and their work will cease to exist. 
that's what this is, you know, this, this sets a very dangerous precedent. Well, you have anticipated my following question. Um, cancel culture was my next question. Uh, what do you think is very clear? I share what you said about the freedom of the arts, and our festival is uh, happy to have you here. Uh, what would Philip have said uh, about what happened to you over this last few, few months, the cancellation, the withdrawal of the book, etc., and this uh, situation of censorship of your work connected to allegations never proved. Uh, have you ever wondered what Roth would have said about it? Well, <laughs> as I answered, uh, as I said to Antonio Monda, you know, a part of Philip would have been ruefully sort of delighted by this because he anticipated um, that his biography, uh, regardless of whether it was, you know, um, overly critical of him as a human being or as or whether it tried to, you know, sort of um, uh, romanticize him. I mean, I've been told both that I'm too hard on him and that I'm not hard enough. Right, depending on whether you love or hate Philip Roth, um, but he he knew that you know he was going to be raked over the coals, and he kind of knew that I was going to be raked over the coals, that I was going to get it going and coming again. That some people would think I was too hard on him, and others would think I was not hard enough. So he would have felt vindicated <laughs> because he he knew that it was going to be extremely controversial. I don't think he expected. Um, you know, for his biographer's life to be destroyed, as it has been. Um, but, you know, again, in Philip's way of dealing with, with sort of having his worst expectations fulfilled was to find it amusing. Um, he would have also been disgusted because I think he would have uh, liked my biography. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, again, don't take my word for it. Um, it was very, very well received. Um, and I think it's it's first rate work. And that's what Philip wanted. He wanted a first rate biography. And he sort of put all his <laughs> all his bets on me. You know, I'm the only authorized biographer. People say, well, we need to authorize another biography of Philip Roth. Well, how are you going to do that? Because Philip is dead. Um, Philip's old friends whom I interviewed are now dead for the most part. Um, you'll never have access to the man. And, um, and frankly, I don't think you'll write as good a biography as I wrote. Um, so, you know, I think that he would have been disgusted, but I think he would have uh, been relieved that a uh, courageous anti-censorship publisher like Skyhorse came along and uh, republished the book. So congratulations for this new release to you, Mr. Bailey. Uh, we have uh, listened uh, to uh, the presentation of Philip Roth, the biography, and uh, the book is going to be released uh, soon in Italy by uh, Einaudi Publishers. Thank you very much, Mr. Blake Bailey. Uh, hope to see you in person in Cortina. Thank you very much once more. Thank you, Francesco. It was it was a pleasure.